Hello, my name is Melissa and I am the director at the Sutliff Museum. Thank you for joining us for our second presentation in our Faces of Freedom digital lecture series. Here we will look at some of the faces behind the abolitionist movement. Some were former slaves, others were born free. All had the same goal, which was to fight for the freedom of slaves. Isabella Bomfrey was born as a slave at the home of Colonel Johannes Hardenberg in Esopus, New York. Both her mother and father were purchased from slave traders, her mother Betsy from Guinea and her father James from modern day Ghana. Born a slave, she had no recollection of her first master since he died while she was just an infant. His son Charles Hardenberg inherited Isabella and her family. By her mother's account, Charles was kind to his slaves and favored her parents because of their respectful behavior, faithfulness, and hard work. Having won Charles's favor, Betsy and James were given a small plot of land where they managed to grow tobacco, corn, and flax. Sometime later, Charles built a hotel nearby and relocated the slaves to a cellar under the hotel. All slaves, men, women, and children, lived cramped on the mud floor a dismal place, as Isabella later recalled. The sun never shone there, and it was filled with mud and water. In the evening, Isabella's mother often prayed with her children. My children, there is a God who hears you and sees you. A God, Mama? Isabella would say. Where does he live? asked the children. He lives in the sky, was her reply and when you are beaten or cruelly treated or fall into any trouble, you must ask help of him, and he will always hear you and help you. In her humble way, Betsy endeavored to show her children that their Heavenly Father was the only being who could protect them in their perilous con condition. This would also strengthen the chain of family affection, which Betsy trusted to connect the widely scattered members of her precious flock. These instructions of her mother were treasured and held sacred by Isabella throughout the years. In 1806, Charles Hardenberg died and his slaves were destined for the auction block. Because Isabella's father was in ill health, it was decided both of her parents would be spared. But nine-year-old Isabella and her brother Peter would not be so lucky. James Neely bought Isabella and a flock of sheep for $100. She did not know where she was going or if she would ever see her mother or father again. Because her first and second masters were Dutch, she also spoke Dutch. She did not know how to speak English, which was unfortunate for her because Mr. and Mrs. Neely did not speak Dutch. She was beaten on a daily basis for not being able to communicate with her mistress. In 1808, a tavern owner and fisherman by the name Martinus Shriver paid $105, and Isabella was on her way to what she hoped would be a better place. Her time at Shriver's, as she would later describe, was wild. She was exposed to a rude, uneducated class of people, yet most were kind and well disposed. She was required to fetch roots and herbs from the woods for making beer. In 1810, Isabella was sold for 70 pounds to John Dumont. By her own account, Isabella found Dumont to be kind, though his wife was not. While enslaved at Dumont's, she met and fell in love with Robert from a nearby farm. Though he was warned not to see Isabella, Robert snuck out one night to see her. When he was caught, he was beaten nearly to death by his master. Robert died shortly thereafter, and the event haunted Isabella for the rest of her life. Between about 1815 and 1826, Isabella bore five children, Diana in 1815, Peter in 1821, Elizabeth in 1825, and Sophia in 1826. The fifth, perhaps named Thomas, may have died in infancy or childhood and may have been born between Peter and Diana. Robert or John Dumont may have been the father of Isabella's first and second children, Diana and Thomas. But this is only a guess, based on the long space of the first two children from the rest. Isabella was then married to a much older man named Thomas. Together they had Peter, Elizabeth, and Sophia. In 1799, New York had enacted the Gradual Abolition of Slavery Act, 
which stated that any child born to a slave mother after July 7, 1799, were to be declared legally free when they reached the age of 25 for females and 28 for males. July 4, 1827, was set as the final emancipation date for the total abolition of slavery in the state of New York. Dumont promised Isabella if she would do well and be faithful, he would give her her free papers a year before New York's set date for emancipation. By all accounts, Isabella was an excellent worker. She would work in the fields with her infant daughter by tying ropes to her daughter's basket and hanging it high in a tree so no snakes could get her, and having a younger child rock the baby back and forth. When the time came for Dumont to give Isabella her free papers, he said she had not fulfilled her obligation. He blamed an injury to her hand that had slowed her work. Isabella vowed she would stay only until the far ha fall harvest was over and until she spun 100 more pounds of wool, then she would leave. But how could she leave without getting caught? She was too afraid to leave at night, and if she left during the day, people would see her leave. Then a thought came to her that she would leave at dawn. Late in 1826, Isabella packed all of her clothes and provisions in one cotton handkerchief and left with her baby Sophia. Isabella ended up at the home of Isaac and Maria Van Wagenen in New Paltz, New York. They took Isabella and Sophia in. It was not long after that Dumont came looking for his possessions, which had run off. I did not run off, Isabella told him, for I thought that wicked, but I walked off believing that all right. When Dumont demanded she return, or he would take her by force, Van Wagenen said he was not in the practice of buying and selling of slaves, but that he would pay Dumont $20 for Isabella's services for the remainder of the year until New York's emancipation would take effect. When Isabella referred to Mr. Van Wagenen as master, he said, there is but one master, and your master is my master. When Isabella asked what she should call them, he said to call them by their names. Isabella lived with the Van Wagenens for one year, and due to their kindness during that time, she converted to Christianity. It was also during this time that Isabella found out her five-year-old son Peter had been sold to a plantation in Alabama. With the help of the Van Wagenens and other Quakers in the community, Isabella was able to file a case against Dr. Gedney to get her son back. It was the first case where a black woman won against a white man. Oh my God, I know I'd have him back again. I was sure God would help me get to him. Why I felt so tall within, I felt as if the power of a nation was with me, Isabella said. Although Isabella did get her son back, Peter had been badly abused physically and made to lie in court that Isabella was not his mother. Later, Isabella moved to New York City, working as a housekeeper for evangelist Elijah Pearson, and befriended a baker named Mary Simpson. Simpson claimed to be one of George Washington's former slaves. Although there is no record of her in the Mount Vernon slave indices, there is an 11-year-old named Mary mentioned. Every year on Washington's birthday, Mary Simpson would celebrate by making ginger cakes and whiskey punch for her customers. Isabella was later employed by Robert Matthews, known as Prophet Matthias, as a housekeeper. When Pearson died under suspicious circumstances, both Isabella and Matthews were accused of poisoning him. Both were acquitted of the murder, but Matthews was convicted of lesser crimes. In 1839, Isabella's son Peter boarded the Zone of Nantucket whaling ship, never to be seen again. When the ship came back to, into port, he was not on it. In his last letter to his mother, Peter wrote, Get me to my home, that's in the far west, to the scenes of my childhood that I like the best. There the tall cedars grow and the bright waters flow. Where my parents will greet me, white man, let me go. Let me go to the spot where the cataract plays, where oft I have sported in my boyish days. 
And there is my poor mother, whose heart ever flows. At the sight of her poor child, to her, let me go, let me go. By 1843, Isabella felt God calling her to preach the truth. It was at this time that she changed her name to Sojourner Truth. The Spirit calls me and I must go, she told her friends. Taking only a few possessions with her, Sojourner began traveling and preaching. In 1844, she joined the Northampton Association of Education and Industry. While there, she met abolitionists Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison and gave her first anti-slavery speech. Although she can neither read nor write, she dictates her biography with the proceeds from her book, The Narrative of Sojourner Truth, a Northern Slave, and her photographs, Truth was able to pay off her $300 mortgage on her home in Florence, Massachusetts. Truth spoke against slavery and for women's rights. In 1851, Truth attended the Ohio Women's Rights Convention in Akron, Ohio. When she got up to speak, there were voices in the crowd who did not want to align themselves with the abolitionist movement. They did not want to hear what this six-foot black woman had to say. However, Truth delivered her anti-woman speech on the right of women to be equals. She left the audience astounded at her ability to speak on the subject. Over the next 10 years, Truth spoke before dozens, perhaps hundreds of audiences. From 1851 to 1853, Truth worked with Marius Robinson, the editor of the Anti-Slavery Bugle, and traveled around Ohio speaking at various events. In 1853, she spoke at a suffragist mob convention at the Broadway High Tabernacle in New York City, and later that year she also met Harriet Beecher Stowe. In 1856, she traveled to Battle Creek, Michigan to speak to a group called the Friends of Human Progress. In 1858, at a meeting in Silver Lake, Indiana, someone interrupted a speech and accused her of being a man. To prove him wrong, Truth opened up her blouse and revealed her breasts. Among her many accomplishments during her full life, Sojourner Truth recruited black troops for the Union Army. In 1864, she was employed by the National Freedmen's Relief Association in Washington, D.C., where she worked hard to improve conditions for African Americans. In October of that year, she also met President Abraham Lincoln. During her time in Washington, D.C., she would ride the streetcars in an effort to force desegregation. In 1870, Sojourner Truth tried to secure land grants for former slaves, an endeavor she pursued for seven years without success. In 1872, she worked on Ulysses S. Grant's presidential campaign. On Election Day, Truth was turned away from voting at the polls. Sojourner Truth settled in Battle Creek, Michigan but continued to travel and speak and fight for equality until her death at her home on November 26, 1883. Not everyone welcomed her preaching and lectures, but she had many influential supporters over the years, including William Lloyd Garrison, Susan B. Anthony, Lucretia Mott, and so many others. Life is a hard battle anyway. If we laugh and sing a little as we fight the good fight of freedom, it makes it all go easier. I will not allow my life's light to be determined by the darkness around me. So Turner Truth's legacy can be seen throughout the country with a monument in Battle Creek, Michigan, and a bronze bust located in Emancipation Hall of the U.S. Capitol's Visitor Center, to name a few. Thank you for joining me for this presentation of Faces of Freedom. If you have any questions, please email or call the Sutliff Museum. Please follow us on social media for more facts about the abolitionist movement, the Victorian era, and of course, the Sutliff family. Thank you.